Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, Libraries in Recovery, or as we started out, what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, we're now in year two of this, what has become a series. It didn't start out as a series, but we were just responding to the circumstances of, uh, of the pandemic declaration a year ago, asking that kind of obvious question, okay, now what? And it has just developed from there. There's been a lot of things to talk about, a lot of interest in trying to figure out what's going on. It started probably, you could call it libraries in reaction initially, just kind of what, what is happening here? How, how serious is this? And then once we began to understand a little bit about the, the virus, it was then more like libraries, okay, in response. How do we, how do we deal with this uh, circumstance now, now that we're locked down, constrained, but still uh, we're open our digital services are open. As a matter of fact, the, the demand for those is skyrocketing. So how are we going to accommodate that? How are we going to do uh, curbside delivery? That, that whole uh, period where libraries were trying to figure out what their response was. Later in the year, once uh, we had a, a clue that there were uh, vaccines and we had hope, I think it was in the fall, there was the dip after, the, after that summer surge and we felt like we were on top of it. We weren't, but we felt like we were. And then we had the end of the year, massive spike. And then we've begun our uh, vaccinations. All to say that uh, this has been a really interesting uh, year, of course, in the, in the Chinese curse sense, interesting. Uh, but also we, you know, we think this represents an opportunity uh, that a lot of people are doing a lot of imaginative things. And uh, well, now is the time. Uh, Today, our session, Broadband as Civic Infrastructure. We're going we're gonna to get into that with the author of a paper by that very name. Um, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. My name is Don Means. I've been uh, hosting these or producing them, I guess you could say, in our partnership with the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, 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 based in The Hague in Netherlands is uh, hosting, this is their Zoom, and they're recording these, and they'll. this session will be up by Monday, and it will be located on, as you can see at the bottom, on the uh, pandemic response page at giglibraries.net, where all prior 41 sessions are uh, located and uh, recorded. We've also been uh, transcribing these sessions or closed caption and translating them into more than 10 languages to make them more accessible and hopefully helpful to people. Our, our series sponsor is Kelly Dry, uh, uh, Warren LLP, a DC based law firm. They've been helping us with uh, particular filings to the FCC. There's a number of things under consideration right now. We'll talk about one today, uh, uh, at least one. And uh, we recommend them. So uh, these are our speakers. We're really lucky to have uh, John and Angela with us. Uh, two people uh, I've known for a long time who've done just outstanding work in, in their respective areas of, of, of research. And Angela has, has organized and created a, the NDIA, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, which has become extremely popular. We'll hear about the current level of membership, but this is the broadest coalition of, of stakeholders around inclusion that I think anybody has ever dreamed up. Uh, and John is always there with deep research. And today, even uh, a bit of advocacy, as I understand your paper, John, um, which this is the title of it. Uh, the link to it is in the registration, as you all would have seen. And then uh, Angela is going to take us through the, uh, the EBB, the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which is designed to do these things, but there's also some outstanding issues that need to be resolved. So this is not yet, as I understand it, quite formalized and available, but imminent. First, we'll do our usual, which is kind of a look at, uh, at uh, COVID and, uh, and what's been happening. So. This is, this is, you know, not so encouraging. It was encouraging in mid-February when that spike, huge spike was, you know, we hit 300,000 cases in one day. 
Uh, and then it just dropped and we go, okay, okay. Well, now it's stopped dropping and it's even starting to go back up. One of the points that you hear about the hospitalization number is the recent stories, maybe you're all kind of tracking this, but one of the recent stories showed that the, of the people that were, have been treated, I guess as hospitalized and otherwise treated, some 30% are showing long-term residual negative outcomes. And this is a, this is a really large number. Uh, and it presents a major challenge for uh, what, what, how people are going to need to be helped and treated uh, going forward. This is yesterday's number. Uh, it's going up, as you see, and we'll just have to see whether it goes back up again. We're in a race with the, uh, uh, the vaccination, which is just phenomenal what they've done here to create these vaccines. There's still no vaccine for HIV. Uh, it's really hard to do, but they managed to do it. I, I guess when you throw enough billions at something, uh, you can do things, uh, but the variants are, you know, this is the, the vaccines are static. The variants are not, they're just the opposite of static. They're hyper evolving. We've got trillions and trillions of these viruses that are looking for ways around defenses. And this is not good at all, uh, but it's maybe not that bad because the vaccines are proving to be effective against the variants so far, but you need to be vaccinated. That then becomes the issue. I wanted to put this up. Uh, I watched this interview uh, yesterday with uh, Larry Brilliant, who's himself a, a phenomenal story. I mean, it's just <laughs> incredible uh, the things that uh, this guy has done. Uh, he was part of the team that eliminated smallpox, the last cases of smallpox in India, among the many things that he's been involved in, but uh, most notably as an epidemiologist and uh, Larry has been sort of the Cassandra around pandemics, but we forget that Cassandra was right. <laughs> we tend to confuse Cassandra with Chicken Little, but Cassandra was actually right. And uh, the point Larry made, I'm putting this link up, I'll, I'll put it again in the chat because I highly recommend it. It's only 10 minutes, but that unless there's a global solution, we really don't have a solution because these, these viruses will continue to mutate They'll, be, they'll find ways around uh, the vaccines or it's very possible. And so we'll just keep being in this pandemic situation as long as there are hotbeds of a uh, of virus uh, mutation. So with that happy note, we'll return to the program here and, uh, and hear from our two speakers. So John, you are up and let me stop sharing here and turn it over to you. All well, right, Don. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for tuning in today. It seems for me that a, it's rare that a week goes by that I'm not on the, the same Zoom with Angela. So it's good as always to be on the same program. What I'm gonna do is talk about what um, Jorge Chemet and I published for the German Marshall Fund on broadband as so social infrastructure. And I'm gonna go through a handful of slides and I wanna emphasize, um, I did co-author this piece with Jorge Schmidt, who's a professor of communications at Rutgers University and a longtime friend. Um, and this piece of work is distinctive for me at least in two respects. One is it's the rare piece of writing by me in which there is essentially no data cited. I'm the guy that has lots of data on um, broadband adoption, on digital skills and a whole raft of other things. Um, but this is more of a piece of scholarship that Jorge and I have engaged in to look at this issue of broadband as civic infrastructure and try to place where we are today and how we think about broadband in a longer arc of history while we identify that there, we think there is something new going on in the policy space as we think about broadband. So let me walk through just a handful. Don, you wanna put your slides in, in play mode? Sure, let me do that. From the beginning. All right. Um, so uh, 
without further ado, um, first of all, what is civic infrastructure? The past week or so in Washington, there have, has been this debate about Biden's infrastructure plans and whether all of the uh, plans in his proposal count as infrastructure. Jorge and I started working on this well before that debate, but we did see broadband as part of civic infrastructure. I think we can all accept that broadband is infrastructure by any reasonable definition of the term infrastructure, but how and whether uh, broadband qualifies as civic in infrastructure um, is another question. So what is civic infrastructure generally? Um, it is inputs into building capacity to create and sustain civic capacity. Um, a little more concretely, city, uh, civic infrastructure encompasses a city's public spaces and civic assets, as well as the social processes. So um, that could include uh, parks, it could include um, uh, cultural amenities like museums, which are places that people can gather in common, but they have very social aspects and dimensions to them. Um, we think that broadband does qualify as civic infrastructure. And in fact, we argue in the paper that we do have a long history in this country of seeing information networks as civic infrastructure. The Communications Act of 1934 really enshrined the notion of universal service into US public policy. The idea of universal service uh, in the communications sphere, you know, predates the Communications Act of 1934, um, extending at least to um, the early part of the 20th century when the uh, head of AT&T at the time, Theodore Vail, um, first uttered um, the term universal service in the context of having uh, telecommunications or telephone networks available in all parts of the country. And he used it essentially as a means to justify a monopoly for universal service, which his company, of course, was. Um, but it's also the case that the notion of broadband as universal uh, or as civic infrastructure uh, really um, took some hold in the 2009 American Recovery and Investment Act. Um, with respect to broadband and telecommunications policy, the act did a couple of things. One is it funded out of the Commerce Department, the BTOP program, which was billions of dollars, um, most of that for um, broadband infrastructure, but about $450 million for um, community um, or public computing projects and um, other efforts to get um, computers and the internet to low income communities. That actually built on some initiatives that began in the Clinton administration, but the 2009 uh, uh, American Recovery Act did help reseed some of those initiatives to think about broadband occupying a civic space as we try to encourage universal access. And then there was also the development of, of the National Broadband Plan, something that I was a part of at the Federal Communications Commission in 2009 and 2010. And the National Broadband Plan had an emphasis on infrastructure, but it did also have recommendations on broadband adoption and use, as well as recommendations on trying to encourage the use of broadband in the civic sphere to develop, uh, deliver um, government services, to deliver telehealth services, and um, even to um, modernize the energy grid. So uh, the 2009-2010 era, was um, a next arc in this longer arc of, of broadband and communications network being seen as part of civic infrastructure. And what happened um, after the funding from 2009 and 10 dried up is that a lot of initiatives were seeded from the bottom up to build on things that were built, uh, that, that were started uh, circa 2010. And that includes NDIA. I, won't spend much time on that here since Angela's gonna talk about it. Um, but in the paper, we talk a little bit about NDIA's formation in the mid part of the last decade. But there are other initiatives um, that we talk about in the paper that 
represent building upon the um, initiatives of 2009 and 2010, like E-rate modernization. Um, there was even a gig.u initiative aiming to try to use universities to push broadband into communities. Um, the gig.u's impact, I don't think was ever that large, but it does represent um, an important part or an important theme that we pick up on in the paper, which is pushing action in this policy space to the local level. So the pandemic happens, um, fast forwarding a little bit to today, and the pandemic has certainly been an inflection point in how we think about the digital divide. But in the paper, we spend some time talking about what has transpired in light of the pandemic, but in fact builds on some efforts at the community level that precede the pandemic by a couple of years. Um, examples include GAP networks, which we talk about in the paper, which is to say community wireless mesh networks that have been springing up in different communities around the country, uh, places like Baltimore, where I live, but also in New York City, Pittsburgh, uh, Detroit, and other places. And they essentially are wireless networks aimed at getting low or no cost access to low income neighborhoods so that people can go online for um, almost nothing. There are a variety of arts and rec and tech projects um, trying to push uh, broadband infrastructure into how uh, community um, uh, recreation centers work and how arts initiatives work in cities. There have been a ton of homework gap initiatives aiming to get computing resources and connectivity to uh, households with school-aged children who don't have uh, um, connectivity. And finally, there's been a focus on digital inclusion, which I won't linger on too much since um, Angela can talk about that. But we are starting to see in um, cities around the country, in state legislatures, um, initiatives that look at broadband as not only about getting infrastructure to rural areas, which really has been the dominant theme in the past decade in thinking about the digital divide, but focusing on get, getting training resources, digital navigators into urban areas to help people get online. So we identify in the paper a number of these initiatives, and then we make the argument that these initiatives are really the sign of something more going on in the communications policy sphere. Um, so we engage in a smattering of scholarship looking backwards over the past um, century to think about different compacts that have emerged in the communications policy space over the years. And the old bargain or compact, as we talk about it in the paper in the mid to late uh, 20th century, is government tolerates or even encourages market concentration in exchange for the private sector ensuring universal service. That was the AT&T monopoly. Um, government let that happen. The private sector kept up its end of the bargain by um, building out networks and making local service affordable so that everybody could have a telephone service. Worked pretty well. Um, post divestiture of the AT&T monopoly, um, the emphasis went from um, tolerating market concentration to encouraging competition. And the storyline, in our view, went something like uh, competition is great, competition will seed innovation, and innovation will further the social goals that we care about, um, universal access and that sort of thing. And deregulation was ascendant, but the basic idea was that um, a hands-off approach to regulation would foster competition, seed innovation, and from that, good things would flow in terms of social benefits. Um, we think, Jorge and I, that the old, that old compact has sort of run its course and that we're starting to see a new compact, which is represented by a lot of the initiatives I just talked about. That new compact basically says innovation is not an end of its, in itself, but a means to an end. We see community-led broadband projects uh, trying to fold broadband into civic infrastructure as seeking to harness innovation for specific ends, not simply to unleash it. And if I had to pick one piece of rhetoric in communications policy speeches over the past decade that really just bugged the heck out of me, that is 
let's unleash innovation. You know, I, I think what we're seeing today is that this notion of let's unleash innovation and hope good things will happen uh, really has run its course. It's now time to uh, focus innovation on furthering social goals and concentrating on the social goals, not concentrating on simply unleashing innovation. So we talk about this in the paper, the outline of the new compact, um, it sort of parses across different levels of government. Um, we still see a strong role for the federal government, but it's more in, in the realm of uh, financing broadband for public purposes, and then a very strong commitment to oversight of enforcement and assessment of progress towards community connectivity. Um, I'm an old Capitol Hill hand from many years back. And so oversight is to me, one of the most important functions of Congress. I think Congress has gotten away from it and we need to build that back into um, how uh, that role for Congress specifically in the communications sphere. Um, secondly, at the state level, make sure states have the capacity for broadband planning so that they have people whose jobs it is to watch how broadband and digital inclusion goals are unfolding in a state. And then finally, uh, building local capabilities um, for serving citizen needs in, in digital skills training, tech support and information literacy. Um, that's putting on localities um, the onus to um, really own implementing and carrying out programs to get more people online in an inclusive way. Um, and that obviously uh, points to local public libraries, but also other community institutions as having um, a big role in, in the local dimension. So with that, I will stop and um, we can uh, do questions, Don, or turn it over to Angela and do questions maybe later. A, maybe a couple of questions, John. Uh, you make a really interesting point about the history uh, there on universal service, uh, telephone, yes, electrification, another excellent example. Seemingly that when we, when a new service or a service is declared a, a basic service, something that you know, we, the society kind of runs on, then there should be affordable access by everyone. And that usually means in traditional infrastructure terms that the cost of provisions of services increase in direct proportion to the distance from the core of the infrastructure. So if you're close to the backbone, it's cheaper to connect you, whether it's gas or water or telecom, whatever. Uh, and so we've taken, we've set up systems that extract funds from the profitable markets, if we can say that, to subsidize the less profitable markets. And that held true. I mean, we did a really good job, I think, with electrification and telephone. When broadband arrived, which I would put in the mid 90s, that seemed to disappear. We, we do not have universal uh, service implementation of broadband. It was at that point when the company said, well, we're just companies. You know, we're like Cisco and Intel. We're private corporations. We'll make investments uh, based on where we can expect a return. And that's, and so that's it. That's the way we're going to deploy. And that's the way they have. And that has in turn cut off a lot of people or separated a lot of people from what is absolutely uh, not only a basic service, which become an essential service. So that's, that's why that happened. You know, I, I guess there were a number of different, it seemed like the cable companies and the phone companies each used each other, which had different regimes to get relief from their respective <laughs> requirements like open network and so forth. And, and so in the process, they both relieved of all the general things that we expected them to do as, as, take, as leveraging uh, public access, uh, public assets, I mean, rights of way and so forth. So uh, do you see that changing? Do you, I mean, we, we tried to recategorize the providers, but we didn't really do it or didn't stick. What, how do you see that getting corrected? Not easily, yet I think there are signs that um, the debate is changing. 
Um, and we see in Maryland, for instance, funding for gap networks, um, which would be um, municipal networks in uh, reaching certain areas. Um, in some of President Biden's proposals, um, there's been some support for the notion of permitting municipal networks um, as a means to spur competition. Some of the carriers are a little um, less hard line about opposition to municipal networks, even though they do maintain that there should not be um, you know, gov government funded build out in areas where networks already exist. But there's been a little bit of a relaxation in some of that hard line nature. Um, I think what is not quite settled is um, whether the theory of the case is changing entirely, which is to say, to your point, Don, um, your account of what was going on in the 90s and into the 2000s about broadband, um, the theory underlying letting what happened happen was that competition would um, supersede the need to have different business units subsidize uh, access for low-income people to mean to attain universal service, which was the old telephone model. Um, the idea was that competition would take care of that. Didn't work out that way. There are a ton of reasons for that. And it has not worked out that way for um, 20 years at least, which is why I think we're starting to see some of the change in the debate. But you know, I would not say the debate has been won by any stretch, um, even if you see some cracks here and there. Okay, good. Well, uh, we're gonna get back to your points about local policy and, and community initiatives. Uh, I think that's the central point that I saw in your paper. But for now, we'd like to uh, go to Angela to uh, tell us about NDIA. I think a lot of the people on today uh, are even members of NDIA and, and welcome to you all if it's your first time here and, and welcome to you, Angela, as well as John for uh, appearing today. So you're also gonna tell us a little bit about the, the EBB and where you see that's going and what, what are the open issues around that uh, that might uh, be amenable to some kind of influence. Angela, awesome. welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for having me. And it was fabulous to listen to John, as usual. So um, it's fun to hear the history, because sometimes when you're all deep in something, you don't kind of step back and look at it from that view. So we appreciate John for many things, and that is one of them. Uh, so that was fabulous. Uh, so I, I am going to talk about EBB. I'll give a quick, like, who is NDIA for the few folks that um, aren't involved with us yet. What would really help is for folks to put in the chat, um, do you want a 101 on EBB? Or you're like, no, nah, nah, nah. I've heard it like four times. Don't tell me again what the basics are. Let's get into the good stuff. But if somebody does, let's do it this way. If you want the 101, put 101 in the chat and I'll do the 101 for folks. I don't want to, I don't want to skip it if people need it. Okay, quick version of NDIA. Okay, Phyllis says 101, got it. Uh, so uh, we got started about seven years ago uh, because there wasn't an entity representing digital inclusion groups on the ground. So we realized that there was a gap out there and we needed to fill the gap. Uh, so we became an entity that represented community-based organizations, libraries. Uh, those are the two that we thought we would for sure have in the community. And then we ended up also attracting housing authorities and local governments. Local governments were the big surprise. Uh, they started to get really involved in digital equity work. One of the first things we did was set definitions because we realized we were using the words digital equity and digital inclusion interchangeably and that was probably not helpful. So the definitions are the digital equity is the goal. This is all individuals and communities having full access to information communication technologies to do whatever it is they need to do. But digital inclusion is the how. These are the activities that would get us to that digital equity. So this is that affordable home broadband, right? That you all talk about quite a bit. The devices, because the mobile phone doesn't cut it, right? And, and it's device ownership, right? Not just having one periodically that the school owns you. Uh, and then having the digital skills necessary to do whatever it is you need to do. And then what we realized during the pandemic is that there's also this need for someone to guide an individual to the different resources. So we call this a digital navigation type of, of uh, social service, that it's a safety net, it's our digital safety net. 
that there needs to be an individual in every community who can guide community members through, uh, where can I get free or low cost internet? Uh, where can I get a free or, or cheap device? Where can I get digital literacy training? Who can help me do this thing right now that this application, like I can't sign up for this vaccine. I can't figure out this website. I need somebody to help me with this like right now. Who can help with those applications? And in the past, we would think of li libraries as often a place where people would go, but then during the pandemic, you couldn't go into the library to get that kind of support. So that's how the digital navigation type of idea got started. So NDIA calls it a digital navigator. We put up a website, we've gathered a working group, we're helping folks like the Salt Lake City Public Library develop their program. And we put as much as we can in a public open source type of, of manner on this digital navigator page. So you can just take it and run with it. Um, we also provide consulting services for those who need a little bit of extra help, but we're trying to set it up so that you could just do whatever it is you needed to do. So NDIA is both that place that does that kind of work. We do the peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Uh, we have our Friday community calls, similar to what you all are doing here uh, with a lot of sharing of what's going on on the ground. Uh, we have our active listserv. We have our webinar series, which is happening right now on Wednesdays at 1 Eastern. Uh, and then we use all that, what we learn from those digital inclusion activists and practitioners on the ground to influence public policy. And so that's taking what you're, you're telling us and then making sure that the folks in DC and now, as John mentioned, state governments too, that's pretty incredible and exciting uh, to be able to help them allocate resources and um, support you in your digital equity work. So I'm going to go, I'm going to open up my uh, EBD slides now and we'll go over the, the basics and of course, happy to ask questions about EBB. And it is where? Dot, dot, dot. Sorry, I had it right there and now it's not showing up. We should have made you do a test, Angela. See, see, you I'm think just you know something. It. You think you have it all covered. You've I done know, it a million times. I think times. I have it, and then I don't because I have too many screens. Yeah, too many screens. I know that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so EBB, um, the federal government decided that there needed to be a fifty dollars subsidy, and this occurred uh, in the stimulus package that was passed in December. Okay, can you guys see those? Yep. Is that sharing? Okay, great. Um, $50 subsidy, $75 in tribal lands, and it is money that goes directly to the internet service provider. Internet service providers can choose to participate or not to choose to participate. All the big ones are gonna participate. If they haven't announced yet, it's in process. The question is whether or not the smaller ones will participate. The service has to be for a service that was already available in December. This, keep, this keeps those, um, you know, oh yes, I sell broadband <laughs> kind of offers from popping up. Uh, so if you get messages from companies you haven't heard of, it's probably not legit. Uh, so this is this is the $10 to $50 a month. And, and so it has to be service where they are the customer was getting charged that amount uh, or is getting charged that amount. And then that amount comes off of their bill. So if the service is $30, the government's going to pay for $30 so that they don't pay the extra $20. They also have the device benefit. So the device one is a lot trickier because it doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of us that the device needs to go through the internet service provider. But because this program was stood up so quickly, uh, it needed to be as fast as possible. And so that device does need to come through the internet service provider. So the internet service provider can choose to include a device in their offerings, or they can choose not to. If they do choose to include it, they're going to decide what the device is. So because customer doesn't decide, they might give them a choice of, you know, one to three, but it's not going to be a huge choice. And then the, the amount is that there'd be a hundred dollars coming from the federal government to pay for that device. And then the household itself needs to pay between 10 and $50 for the device. The, um, the, the part about this that sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap heads around is that it always needs to go through the internet service provider. 
right? So the, the device and the internet service itself, the, the money always flows through the ISP. Uh, one service per household. So if you have two people in the household and it is one household, not two people living together who are in separate households, but if it's one household, you can do like a mobile service for one person and a wireline service for the other person. And it is also one device per household. What do households get? Uh, the benefit covers anything above dial-up. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, well, kind of awesome, right? It, it means that um, it means that it might be slow, but it also means that if you're in a rural area where that's the only thing available, you can still get the benefit to cover it, right? So that was a tricky spot when they were trying to write up the legislation on that. Um, it does keep per gigabit plans from being included. So those are the ones that can end up costing people a lot of money if you're paying per gig. So those are not possible, which is a lot of satellite services per gig. Um, the devices themselves can't be mobile phones. And they so they need to be a laptop or a tablet that can support video conferencing. Because really, and, and Wi-Fi enabled, it, the idea was that we need to use this during the pandemic. So thus, those aspects and those benefits are necessary. And as mentioned, it has to be an offer that the ISP had publicly available on December 1st. Bulk plans. This is a big question every time we talk to library folks or school folks, right? Wow, wait a minute. We were already paying for these devices, um, these ser the service. Can we just get our cost for that covered? The answer is no. So it has to be a cost that was being incurred or is being incurred by the household, not by a community institution. Uh, the emergency connectivity fund that passed recently in the American Rescue Plan that is currently rules that are being written at the FCC, that one could end up covering the bulk. The place where bulk is valuable is that, or could be used is in a, particularly in a housing situation where the, the landlord was including the cost of the broadband in the payment that the tenant needs to make. And so say if the rent is 700 and the internet was 60, and so then 760 is what, plus any other utilities, the tenant was paying, then that landlord could apply for the, um, the benefit in order to take it off of somebody's bill, but not to benefit themselves, only to benefit their tenants. Who is eligible? So they, really, they use the lifeline eligibility is what they did, and then they added to it. Right, so they use the lifeline eligibility, which is pretty much poverty guidelines of 135%. Um, SNAP, right, is the, the one that most folks who are eligible would fall under. Uh, but then they also added Pell Grant and they also added substantial loss of income. That one's a little bit trickier, right? So if your income dropped and you're below, I think it was 50 or 75,000, depending upon how many people in your household um, income level, then you could say, I would like this benefit also because you know I went from full-time to part-time. And here's the paperwork that shows I went from full-time to part-time. The other tricky part to this is that the eligibility isn't just what the FCC is saying in terms of eligibility. If an internet service provider already had a low cost offer, that internet service provider can say, can, can apply to the FCC to have their low cost offer um, be a, be that their eligibility for that low cost offer be the same eligibility for their participation in EBB. Um, best example for this is Comcast um, has a service for veterans. So they would be eligible in, I think it's parts of, I don't know, I'm gonna have to check on that one. Comcast definitely has different eligibility than Lifeline. So things like that, right, can cause a little bit of confusion. And so this is the why it's important to have some local folks who understand because it will definitely vary per company. How do households apply? Uh, they can do so through directly through the National Verifier, which is run by USEC. Um, library folks are aware of who USEC is, a universal service access company, administration company. Or they can go directly through the ISP or they can do it via mail. If an internet service provider has a process approved by the FCC, then the whole thing will take place through that internet service provider. If the internet service provider does not have a process approved by the FCC, then that internet service provider is going to send them to use the national verifier to use that to get approved in order to get service from the ISP. You can't sign up via phone, but you can sign up via mail. And they did set up a phone number for, for answering questions. So that's fabulous. 
When does it start? Probably the end of April, early May. We do not have an exact date. There were some folks passing around exact dates. Those were made up. <laughs> there's, there's no exact date. I don't know why people do that, right? <laughs> it was a company, of course, uh, trying to show some clarity, I guess. Um, the, the applications, um, as I said, can go can, can be online or can be via mail. Um, because it's a limited 3.2 billion, when that money runs out, that money runs out, right? So we're encouraging folks as soon as it opens up to, to get your, your constituents signed up for it, because then they're going to have more months where they can get the benefit. USAC will maintain a tracker of how much money is left, and they will give notice when it's starting to get close. So that's another reason for libraries in particular to be drawing attention to here's how much is there. There's probably only two months left. The, the USAC is going to be very clear about that. Outreach. The FCC is creating some new materials and some of them aren't too bad. <laughs> we were a little worried because, you know, it's a bureaucracy. So we weren't sure if they're going to be any good, but they actually, uh, I'm pretty impressed. There's some slides now on their website. You can go to their um, their EBB page um, or our EBB page, which leads you to their EBB page and get some more information from them. Um, we're also seeing local organizations start to create materials, coordination at the local level, dissemination about EBB. Folks don't know about EBB. Those who are eligible are likely to not know. Those who touch low-income communities are likely to not know. So the more like touch points that are out there, the better. So the more you can spread this within your community, the better. There's no money for that outreach. It's really just because we all think it's important that we're doing this. Um, but it is, it is a valuable benefit. So here's our website, getemergencybroadband.org. They actually did come up with their own like URL, which is fabulous. And you know, the how to apply, who's eligible, all of that. The, the piece that's not live yet is the use your zip code to see what the offers would be in your community. Um, but still, you can still see how the process works and you can see the eligibility and the materials you would need to have. So it's great that they have that posted and it's great that the phone number is also live already. So if you do have some questions about you know, exactly how this would work, you can totally call them. Um, I'm going to come back to questions real quick. Um, the webinar series that I mentioned earlier is every Wednesday, and we welcome you to that. Okay, Don, back to you. Don, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, Judith asks, uh, uh, what about people who could not get internet essentials because they had subscribed to another service less than two years ago? Are they yeah. SOL? No, they are not. The, the FCC heard what folks were saying about that being problematic with the discount offer. And so if you had service with that company previously or currently, if you um, had bad debt with that company, you cannot be kept participating in EBB. Okay. And Rebecca asks, is there any way for people to apply in advance uh, no, no, for providers to, to collect applications now? Do we start outreach now? I would not start outreach now. I would plan your outreach now. Start your outreach to intermediaries, not to households. Uh, okay. Okay. That's fine. Is there, uh, is there an opening to uh, influence the final order? Or is it, are they asking for any kind of comments right now? No, it's, it's all wrapped up. What's happening right now is that the, um, the USAC has, has it in their ballpark now where they're figuring out exactly how it works, which is what you can see when you go to their, their EBB page. Okay. Well, this looks like a, a, you know, all these all these funds, they look like a substantial amount of money, but when you start dividing them by tens of millions of people, they're not so big. But in fact, they, they are, can be helpful and they also help set priorities. You know, we understand that this is important. That's what we're, you know, providing funds for it. So let's keep that going even after we use up the funds. So, um, 
Okay, we're can gonna I answer, open this up. Can I answer one ahead. question about when their money runs out? Uh -huh. uh, yes, so when, when the money, I wouldn't switch somebody to Lifeline. Lifeline's not really a broadband subsidy and Lifeline's really a phone subsidy, $9.25. When you were getting $50 from the government and now you're gonna get $9.25 and they're the, the companies that are participating in EBV are much wider than the companies who participate in Lifeline. That's a long, complicated answer. But mm -hmm. um, but no, I wouldn't switch somebody to Lifeline. What they can switch to is the low cost offer from that company. Um, and so this is where a lot of that outreach locally is important to help folks understand they're gonna get a notice from the ISP and they'll have a choice of what to do. And the ISP does have to notify people. But if folks aren't watching for that notification, they could end up, you know, being a service that they didn't want to pay for. So that's a really good question. Okay. Angela, so so the question I had follow up on: if they get the benefit, if they were denied the uh, the low cost service from the from the cable company, and then they sign up for this, and then the money runs out, can they go back, or will they be fall in that same catch-all phrase of? two years, you have to wait two years without our service to get it again. And are we gonna go back to that same problem? That, that's a great question, Judith. Um, so we will, I, we will find the answer to that question. So, if, so let, let's talk through a couple of those scenarios super fast. If someone signs up for, for the, this $50 benefit, they may not want the discounted offer because it might not be as much speed as their household needs. So they might go for that higher cost plan and get the $50 off of that. And so then they're not they're right, that doesn't put them in that discount offer. So that takes those folks into a different path. But I think what you're asking is they use this and they get into that discount offer there. So basically they're getting it for free, right? Because the discount offer is 10 to $20 a month. And so now it's all being paid by the federal government and they were being kept from even signing up for that discount offer previously. Can they roll into that discount offer when EBB ends? And we will get an answer for that because that's a really good question. Yeah, that's what I want because many of so many of the people, what they've been saying is that they, they, they paid extra because they needed the speed and they needed the internet so it was for their family and they compromised on other things and now that and then they were being like that they couldn't get this and it's like a cat's 22. It, it, it totally is and what some of our community groups have done like tech goes home they have an arrangement with a um a hotspot provider so that they can get that that family a hotspot temporarily i think it's like a six month waiting period or something like that with comcast Get them a hotspot temporarily so then they're no longer a comcast customer and then they can sign them up for internet essentials it's a crazy workaround uh this is a great uh particular question and a good example of the kind of conversation that flows through the ndia uh, listserv uh which angela you might put up there if you want to invite people to join that and i could just hear this actual this exchange you just had with judith playing out in a series of emails but I'd like to get back to uh, where I think these intersect at uh, uh, around John's point on local policy and the devolution of policy down to the community level, which uh, this is what we actually thought when the arrival of broadband, that now people have much, much more agency because of the capabilities of, of the World Wide Web, which of course was true and remains true. A lot of other things have happened as well. But uh, uh, it was also true that, that the providers had their own solution. They're kind of one size fits all. And they didn't fit in most places because communities are so different. As a matter of fact, we would contend they're unique. When you add up all the different circumstances, the, the, the topology, the density, the socioeconomics, uh, the existing infrastructure, and the other infrastructure, traditional infrastructures, as well as the local priorities. You know, what does a community have? What's its own plan? And, and if you come in from the outside and try to just say, here's, here's an infrastructure to match that, it's a mismatch. Uh, as we say, it's a case, you, know, you need an individual plan for your community. As we say, it's either a case of plan or be planned. And frankly, you really don't want to be planned by uh, a large corporation in another place that's not invested in your community uh, anywhere to the extent that you yourself are as a community. So 
the the process is what I'm trying to get at, uh, John and Angela, about developing such uh, policy. How do you see those happening? I mean, we you know, there's all there's usually some person who kind of steps up and kind of starts it going. We've said for a long time that libraries are an ideal place to have that conversation because libraries, librarians are trusted institutions. They don't have uh, an agenda other than helping people. They don't have to be subject experts. They just facilitate conversations and bring them in. So how do you see that actually that devolution or evolution of local community policy happening from each of your perspectives? John. I, having asked different cities at various times, people in different cities, why, why is your city seeming to do awfully well in thinking about the equity dimensions of smart city initiatives, for instance? And the answer invariably is because somebody in the leadership, the mayor, um, makes it a priority to think about the equity dimensions of digital tools. So it's about leadership. The other issue though, to be aware of is, um, I think as a matter of national policy, you don't want to solely rely only on local leaders seizing the banner in order to promote as a nation digital equity. So, and I think we're starting to see this take hold in an organic way because enough leaders have stepped up to the plate. Other cities are starting to scratch their heads or smack their heads and say, we need to get involved. Um, and I think there's a role for um, states, for civic society like Angela's group to be the resources for helping the laggards um, get up to speed in thinking about these issues once they realize that it's a big deal and the pandemic has made everybody realize that this is a big deal. We're seeing some of that leadership occur through coalitions where the library is one of the leaders, sometimes the coordinator of a digital equity coalition. And so then they are the ones that help um, set the tone for the coalition. And that's where public policy can be influenced because then it's not just the library doing it. The library is helping multiple community organizations do it. Kansas City has been doing this for years, right? They got started at the same time NDIA did. So that's like seven years of the library leading the digital equity coalition there. I live in central Ohio. The Columbus Public Library is leading our coalition here. Uh, there's examples all across the country of libraries doing this, and I would love to see more libraries do that because I think these coalitions have had and can have really incredible impact on how those public monies are spent, how philanthropy money is spent. Do you have any kind of a template that, uh, that libraries could use to convene we with? We do, in fact, we have a, um, we have a building a coalitions guidebook, and we'll stick that in the chat. Very good, very good. Uh, one point that we've tried to make that I think supports this is uh, something that you uh, pointed to, John, in your paper, uh, access to government services, so-called. Uh, we would say that government, really at all levels, has an obligation to assure access to public information and public services. So. We've seen since around 2000 the the automation of uh, of public services, you know, e-gov in a word, uh, for cost savings and convenience. Uh, they've automated things, uh, starting out with paper processes and then developing services you can't even do with paper. And you say, well, okay, that's great, but who are those for? And they go, oh, well, those are for people that are connected. We go, oh yeah, well, it's one thing for Amazon to do that. It's quite a different thing for the government to say these services are only available to people that, that have access. And when you challenge them, they go, oh yeah, well, um, they can go to the library, they'll help you. And they will, but they don't share any of those savings with the library. And the library is just another job on, uh, you know, this given to the library that they take on because they'll just say yes to anything basically. Uh, but it is really a shortcoming. And the further point on hard infrastructure is that that burden shifted onto the libraries then becomes a requirement the libraries put on the patrons to come to the library to access those services. And so that for us is a case to extend that physical point of access 
into neighborhoods across communities. And it's a low cost way for libraries to do that and increase uh, inclusion, uh, if I've got the terminology straight, uh, and, uh, uh, and hopefully increase equity, at least as a, as a backup for, for people that don't have anything else, or if they have it and they lose it, it's another, it's another, uh, another strategy. One, somebody mentioned the, the ECB or the ECF, the emergency uh, E-rate fund. We, we had a special session about that yesterday. It'll be up on the, on the website to talk about here shortly. Um, John, Angela, you guys have been doing this tag team. I wasn't aware of that. I thought I had an original idea to invite you to be together. <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm gonna ask you to ask each other a question. You've heard each other. Which, and I'm going to start with you, Angela. What, ask John something that you haven't asked him or he hasn't said or put him on the spot, would you? John, of all the research that you've done, what do you think has been the most impactful? I wrote a piece in 2009 when I was at the Pew Research Center that said, if you build it, will they log on? <laughs> and that asked the question, or looked at some data and said, well, if broadband as a public investment, President Obama, is going to be about infrastructure, what do we make of the fact that we know that 90 some percent of households in the nation are wired with broadband, but at the time, 65% subscribe? What's up with that 30 percentage point gap? And I had some answers to that question in the piece that I wrote, and I'm told, that it got some people in the Obama transition team wondering about that very question. I subsequently briefed them on it and it had something to do um, with um, the $450 million that NTIA put out for um, the social dimensions of access. Something that to do with it. Awesome, I love it. So that, that, that zeroes in on that point between uh, affordability and usefulness or however we want to call that value proposition that people make about a service, even if it were free, a certain number of people wouldn't use it because they don't see the value of it. So that's- That was more true then than it is today, but there's an element there, yes. Yeah, yeah. Can I, and, can I offer, Don, that it's yeah. not just about the value now, the reasons people don't subscribe, even when it's free, go way beyond seeing the value. It has to do with privacy. Um, free internet sounds like a scam. It does sound like a scam, right? Um, it, it, there's there's all the other reasons that technology scares people or they are mistrusting of technology can keep someone from being like, yeah, sign me up for that. All the reasons we discussed earlier, which is like somebody's going to feel like you're going to get hit with a bill at the end of it. Like, no, thanks. I definitely cannot handle a $70 bill in a few months. Right. I mean, it's complex uh, because it gets it gets deep into people's psychology and there's a lot of that, <laughs> a lot of different approaches. Okay, John, your turn. Okay, um, I will preface this by emphasizing that Angela does not have to name names, but um, in explaining digital inclusion to a policymaker at any level of government, what has been the silliest response to hearing about the concept that you have received? Uh, the silliest response. I don't know if I have a good answer to that one. Um, the most common is everybody has a mobile phone. Right. That's, that's the most common one that we get, that I get. Um, Why don't you explain what's wrong with that? <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. So mobile phones, the device itself is limiting and then the data caps on that device are limiting in terms of the service. So the device is really the carrier of the service, but it's, people think of it as, right, because it is both the device and it's the service itself. Um, we, we have a problem now with our, oh, here's another one, digital na natives. So we assume young people just know these things. Uh, yeah, they know TikTok. <laughs> ask one to create a spreadsheet, right? Um, I did this with actually my own child and her friends because I was like, come on, 
these guys, these kids are smart. Like her friends are honor students. They can copy paste some stuff into a spreadsheet for me. No, they had never used a spreadsheet before. So, so if they haven't been, the school is now rectifying that. <laughs> but um, if, if, we, if we don't expose our kids to more, right? Then that's all they'll know is the mobile phone. So there are, there are kids who get into college and they don't know how to type. I have a staff member who struggles to type because he never learned all 10 fingers. He only learned to peck. Two uh, fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Don, how many fingers do you use to type? All right, all right. <laughs> it's the Christopher Columbus method, right? Discover a key and land on it. <laughs> never just, heard that Just rely on autocorrect and just blow. Um, <laughs> get there. But it's a great point about the phone. It, it's a phenomenal device. It's changed the world and society and, and the mobility is not to be discounted. And you know, I wouldn't give mine up for much of anything. At the same time, the idea of, of writing a two page paper on a phone, much less a spreadsheet or most online forms are not that phone friendly, especially government forms. Uh, so it just comes up short as a, as a productivity tool. But extremely valuable at the same time. I think this is why there's this confusion. If it's so valuable, why don't we just let it handle this job? This is not just a US, this is a worldwide tendency to, to say, well, you know, everybody has a phone, everybody's connected. Well, they're not. Uh, and usually there's only one phone in the, in the family and guess who gets it? Um, eight fingers, okay, Sean. Uh, the, a, quick, a quick story if I may, Don, good. I was at a meeting once with a lot of economists talking about whether the mobile device is a substitute for the wireline service at home. And during a break, one of the economists started complaining about how a few weeks ago, my uh, um, service went out. I won't name the company. It was a wireline service, a cable modem service. And it took that company three days to get out to my house to fix my internet. And oh my gosh. And he was the same guy earlier insisting that mobile and wireline were a substitute. And so I said, so you must have then just canceled your wireline service and relied there on thereafter on your mobile, right? And he was like, uh, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> so. It's okay for poor people, but it's not okay. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, outages are are not un, you know not unheard of and actually increasingly common. Uh, we're facing uh, an increased prevalence of severe weather events, climate driven yeah. weather events that that knock out uh, infrastructure for days or, or even a week. Fires in California, floods along the coast, high winds, you know, everybody has their flavor of disaster. So having a backup, having two sources of connectivity at least is smart if you can manage it, if you can afford it. Uh, that's again, where the library can come into play as a backup resource. Uh, and uh, so, uh, we're, we're over our hour just a little bit, but we're not too worried about that. This is not TV. We don't <laughs> have to cut for the hour for the next show. It's just us. So we've run over a little bit. So, uh, but it might be time for uh, a, a, a last word here and a close and a call to action because I, I, I ask you both to think about that. So Angela, why don't you close for us here and... Okay, so my call to action is pretty big. It is, um, if you're not already talking to community-based organizations in your area about digital equity, I encourage you to do that. Because some of those that weren't doing the work before are probably doing it now because the pandemic forced them into it because they couldn't meet their mission if they didn't. So you may have thought they weren't, but now they might be. Good one. Is there a general way to find such organizations or most people just are aware of who's doing that in their community? So there's two ways. One is maybe it will work, which you use NDIA's affiliates list to see if any of our affiliates are in your town. The other way is you have to ask around. <laughs> the other way is a little more time intensive. Maybe ask your library. They should know. John. They might know. That's the question. I encourage you they to They should find know. Out. They might know. They should know. John. Mine is not too far afield from Angela's, which is talk to your local elected officials about what they're doing about digital equity and supporting it in the community. Because the electeds 
are going to be part of the solution because they can eventually get the money. So talk to the electeds, in addition to what Angela said, talking to the community organizations. That, that's a good one, John. Uh, we've seen a, a sea change in awareness for elected officials over the last three, four, five years where uh, the, and especially since the pandemic, since the, uh, the, the, the value of connectivity has just become so evident uh, and that uh, the economic health uh, of communities relies on having a, a, a decent uh, broadband infrastructure. Uh, it's either get one or your town is, is going to, you know, it doesn't really have much of a future because the kids are all going to leave and no companies are going to move in if they don't, if they don't have a, a connectivity platform to operate, learn, study, and the rest of it. So uh, the awareness has gone up uh, at every level of government. John, you also made the important point about the, the role of states, which we think is definitely on the rise now as these same governors have the same uh, awareness levels and are trying to do things. And it seems appropriate as we move, as we devolve towards local policy, that that intermediate stage of government, state uh, uh, government, which actually all municipalities are subsidiaries of state government, unlike the state governments is subsidiary of the federal government. So they know their, they know their states uh, and uh, care about the communities in their states, they should anyway, and they're a good source of leadership and funding as a lot of this funding flows through that channel of state uh, agencies. Uh, there's a term for that, but whatever it is. So uh, I, I yeah. would add quickly that there's, an enduring need for education for policymakers on the dimension of the problem. Part of it is network deployment, and that's where the focus has been over the past six to eight years. But there is this adoption problem, people not being able to subscribe due to affordability. Um, policymakers are sometimes less attuned to that. So I think yeah. education on an ongoing basis on those points is important. And nail them on that uh, that access to public uh, information and services point. You know, how are you doing that? How are you, you know, how are you actually making those available people? I mean, the, the homeless people are probably paying a huge tax rate uh, just on on uh, alcohol and cigarettes. Uh, so everybody actually is a consumer of public services or, or can be and has a right to be. Uh, and so I want to uh, I want to ask everyone here to unmute, unmute if you would, everyone, please, uh, because we want to, we want to thank our speakers. And if we were all together in person where we normally would be for such an interesting presentation, we'd give you a round of applause. So that's what I'd like everybody to do now is give us, give our speakers a round of applause. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Okay, this should be, uh, this recording should be up in a few days. We're going to hang out here. I'm going to stop recording now. Thank you.